morning. I want to thank all of you for, um, for joining us this morning. I am just really, really excited to introduce to you our guest speaker for this morning, Jessica Warren. And I've heard Jessica speak before. She um, gave several webinars last year that I attended and she's just wonderful. I think you, you are all in for quite a treat this morning. Jessica is the um, University of Georgia Agriculture and Natural Resource Agent and County Extension Coordinator for Camden County. And um, her work focuses on invasive species management, coastal water quality, and natural resources education. Jessica has a Bachelor of Science in Forest Resources with a concentration in wildlife and a Master of Natural Resources with a focus on conservation energy, both from UGA. That's very impressive, Jessica. And um, Jessica's presentation to us today is on the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards Program. And this is a wonderful new program that's been created by University of Georgia Extension. Jessica played a major role in it. And um, what I was even more excited about than anything is not only to have Jessica today, but because the program itself dovetails just beautifully with our master gardener interest in promoting native plants, pollinators, and wildflowers in our community. So um, Jessica, again, we are just so excited to have you with us this morning and I'd like to hand it over to you now, please. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. And thanks everybody for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm gonna do a brief intro presentation to the program and then we'll do actually, um, a, we'll talk on pollinators. Um, so the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards Program is a statewide initiative. Um, it was created by myself and uh, one other agent who is the Northeast Georgia Area Water Agent. Um, he specializes just in water. So he did the, the water components of the program and um, he helps manage, well, he manages our website, which I'm very thankful for because that's not my gift. Um, and I worked on the other components, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we started this program, it was kind of a, an idea, like a, we'd love to see this in Georgia kind of thing that we had, um, that came up in a meeting one time, and um, we applied for a, a grant, not a large grant, um, through the Center for Urban Ag, and this is kind of a lot of what our pandemic time was spent on, was creating <laughs> this program. Um, and also, I am very informal, so if you have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to interrupt me or stop me or say what you need to say. So um, the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards Program provides educational resources to teach Georgians about a number of sustainable concepts, um, but protecting natural resources, increasing plant and animal biodiversity, conserving soil and water, um, providing wildlife and pollinator habitat and improving public and environmental health. So these are kind of our goals. So after learning about sustainable landscape management practices, participants have the opportunity to measure their own activities. So the activities that they're doing in their home or business landscape um, with the program metric scorecard and earn Georgia Green Landscape certification status for their landscape. So we've had master gardener groups do this for gardens that they have um, for the public. We've had actually a number of master gardener groups um, since we've launched this that have been really interested and have, have certified their public gardens or their demonstration gardens. We've had churches do this. Um, we've had some businesses participate. And then of course our biggest demographic has been homeowners who have participated in the program. And the program is free to participate in as we'll talk about a little more. Um, so it's open to everyone. We wanted it to be very available to everyone. The only cost is if you purchase a yard sign to put up in your landscape, which is $15. So with certification, if you go through the program, um, you know, participants receive, well, first off, the satisfaction of being a good sustainable gardener and landscaper in Georgia and contributing to natural resource protection. Um, you also get a certificate. This is free part of the program, um, either printed or 
um, emailed to you, whichever you prefer. And also, as I mentioned, the option to purchase an attractive yard sign that helps designate your landscape and hopefully kind of peer pressure your neighbors. <laughs> so a little bit on, um, we're gonna go into the goals quickly of the program, but this program, what we were hoping with it is that it would encourage Georgians to adopt more environmentally friendly practices and to also think about how their land use activities, whether your land is a thousand acres or your, your land is a thousand square feet, um, how those practices and things that you're doing on your piece of land complement can complement the natural world, but also the impacts they can have if you're not doing positive things, we'll just say. So the goals of our program, um, first is to inspire and educate. Um, we wanna educate citizens of Georgia about more sustainable landscaping practices. Through doing this, we're hoping to increase habitat for wildlife and pollinators. Um, and through creating more habitat for wildlife and pollinators, create connectivity. Um, create connectivity between landscapes, between natural areas, creating corridors for wildlife. Um, you know, we all, things are so divided up now. Um, we have such a developed landscape um, that it really has an ecosystem effect. And connectivity is really important um, in order to sustain those ecosystems, which we're dependent on to, to live and to survive as a species. So some more of our program goals are to decrease stormwater runoff and non-point source pollution. I don't know how it's been in the metro area, but the last several months have been extremely rainy down here on the coast. So uh, stormwater runoff is definitely something that I and my clientele, if they're paying attention, can, can uh, really relate to. Um, and with stormwater runoff, of course, there is a lot of non-point source pollution. So whether that's from fertilizers or pesticides or, you know, um, from the roads, from cars, from litter, from pet waste, um, livestock waste, all of those things, you know, th those pollution sources increase as we're having more stormwater runoff. Another goal is to increase soil health, water quality, and biodiversity in Georgia. If you're not familiar with the term biodiversity, which I think a lot of people kind of are now, um, it used to be more of a more of a, a academic word than it. I think it's made it more into the main population now. But biodiversity is literally diversity of life, so number of different species, both in an area and globally. And biodiversity is really important for to continue life on Earth, basically. All right. There we go. So another, um, our, our further goals are to protect and conserve natural resources, which is kind of an obvious overarching concept there. And then lastly, also to save citizens time, money, and labor through working with and not against nature. Um, I see this especially a lot on the coast. Um, we have people that move from all over the country to retire here, and they're really gung-ho to have whatever they had, wherever they're from, grow here on the coast, which is a very different um, climate and very different conditions, even than anywhere else in the state of Georgia, much less from other states. Um, so, you know, trying to get people to plant native plants and to work with nature instead of against it, you know, to work with the conditions we have instead of trying to constantly battle them. So the program is based on 10 different educational components and we'll go over one of them a little bit today. Um, this is targeted towards the general layperson. So, you know, I've had some groups of very avid master gardeners or master naturalists that still say they've learned a lot from the program. I've had some that, you know, learns a lot from some components, but others they've studied up a lot on, on their own. So, you know, maybe there, there's not as much new information there for them, but our target is, you know, our general Georgia homeowner, business owner. Um, we want this to be accessible for everybody. So our, we have 10 basic educational components, um, composting, mulching, pollinator habitat, welcoming wildlife, 
water conservation, water quality, stormwater, invasive species, which focuses on plant species, native plants, and biodiversity. So for each one of those components, we have um, a presentation. There's, um, which I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, there are PDFs of each of those components, the presentations for each of those components. So you can look at um, the, the presentation in a PDF format if you prefer that. You can also um, watch pre-recorded videos of them, which is basically just us giving the presentation. Um, and there's a YouTube channel that also contains all of those videos. Um, we're hoping over time to also have some like how-to videos and some more extra resources added on there as well. Um, everything is self-contained in the website. So we've got some people who um, have an agent that's really excited about this program and it's integrating it and it's teaching those resources in a live format. But then we've got some people who's whose agent's just not, um, maybe doesn't have the time or that's just not their niche. Um, so anyone in the state, whether they have um, a local extension agent that's you know, actively promoting the program or not, can participate in the program equally. They can access all these resources themselves as an individual, do it at their own pace. Everything's available online um, at the website. And then um, our agents across the state do have access to all the PowerPoint presentations and promotional materials and resources um, through a shared drive we have on the cloud. As I mentioned, we also have a YouTube channel. So every all the videos are um, embedded on our website. So basically it just makes it really easy for you. You can just click on it and start playing. But there's also a YouTube channel if anybody's really big into YouTube and wants to follow on there, watch directly from there. Um, as I mentioned, participants complete a scorecard um, for self-certification. We did when we launched the program in March, um, we offered live presentations for 10 weeks um, just to kind of get people more excited. So this is just a glance at the program metric. So we have, um, as I mentioned, there's 10 educational components and the actions on the metric are, are grouped by those 10 educational components. So we try to make it really straightforward. We know that um, not everybody has the same ability, same amount of technical skill, we'll say. So um, it's really straightforward. You click on it. All you do is you click the box next to the action if you're doing it and it puts a check mark and it auto calculates. So it calculates for each section like um, you know, this top one up here, which you probably can't see super well, but it says composting at home. So those are the actions for credit under composting. So each one of those that you check has um, points and it tells you how many points, but points accredited to it. Um, so it'll give you a, a, a um, total for the composting action, but it'll also at the end add all of your actions from all the boxes together to give you a score. Um, and as I mentioned, it auto calculates, uh, it requires 70 points. Uh, we kind of tried to keep it simple. Most people think 70 is passing and below 70 is failing. So there are 63 possible actions, but each action has a different value, um, which is mainly assigned by the ease of the action or the cost. So things that are super simple to do, or maybe it's an action that's a not doing something like say not composting, um, dairy and bones, you know, that's, that's probably going to have less value than something that requires a little more work. Um, so they have between two and four points of value each. As I mentioned, you need 70 for certification. Most people have no, most people who are interested in this program are doing enough practices that they already have no trouble certifying. Um, it, on average, it takes about 22 of the actions um, in order to pass or to certify. Um, we wanted it to be challenging yet attainable. So, um, and I've got a lot of people now who are very competitive about how many points they can get or if they scored a higher score than their neighbor or their friend or their fellow master gardener. So it's kind of interesting to see um, how people get pretty competitive about it. 
So this just shows the last um, page of the metric and it's just your contact information. All of that is kept confidential. It's only shared um, with other agents. It's, you know, just we keep a spreadsheet so that um, say, since we're in my office, uh, myself and Martin are the ones, even though he's not in my office, that are recording and compiling all the data. We wanted it to be accessible to local agents. So say, um, you know, if, and I'm not sure who's North Fulton, is it Melissa Mati Murphy? Yes. I get confused because Fulton has multiple agents, but I was pretty sure Melissa was who would be overseeing you guys. Um, so like if Melissa wanted to see who was participating, you know, or who was interested in the program and had certified, she could go on and check the spreadsheet and she could see, you know, if she wanted to reach out to a specific group that was participating in the program. But other than that, your information is confidential. It's just your, your name, address, phone number, email, that kind of thing. We do like to know what county the landscape is in so that we can keep track. Um, over time, we're hoping to have a map of how many um, different certified landscapes we have across the state in different counties, not with any information associated with them, just the number of landscapes. Um, and then you just indicate whether you'd rather have your certificate mailed as a hard copy or emailed to you. And if you'd like to purchase a landscape, a uh, sign for your landscape, you check that box. And then there's also one just asking if you are willing to have your name in town, not your address, um, listed in a news article or press release in case that's something that your local agent is interested in. Um, you can email or mail in your certification uh, metric. And then um, this is what our certificates look like, even though the name is in a little different text. But um, as I mentioned, the certificates are free. The only cost to the program is the sign. Um, and this is what our landscape signs look like. Um, they're actually a little more colorful than they look in that picture, but the sun was kind of washing things out a little bit that day. Um, but the signs are $15. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a way to take credit cards right now, though we're working on that. But um, check our money order. Um, they're a weather resistant, colorful aluminum composite. They have pre-drilled holes for mounting and they, are, they come with the screws um, and mounting instructions, even though the mounting is really straightforward. There's two holes, there's two screws. You can put it a lot of people put them on their mailbox. We've had people put them on like a, a stake in their garden. Um, so, and it it's basically, um, the sign is our branding graphic. So we worked with one of the graphic designers at UGA and um, he did a great job. I had this idea of like, I love cone flowers. They're native across the state. I think that's a good representation and we need a native bee. He's like, don't you want a honeybee? I said, no, I don't want a honeybee. They're from Europe. I want a native bee. <laughs> so um, he did this great job. You can't see it in this picture, but the, the bumblebee even has like pollen baskets that are full on his legs. So, um, you know, kind of kind of representative of our goals here. Um, I had him even change a few things because he had some like non-native trees in the background. And I was like, Jay, that's, that's not what we're going for, even though no one will probably notice but me. So um, the signs turned out really great. They're really sturdy. Um, and I think that's about it about the signs, let's see. And then I was gonna see if we had any questions about kind of the overview of the program before we went into a little of the meat of it. All right, I see there's one in the chat. Let's see if there's more than one or just that one. All right. How do you join Georgia Green? Okay, so in order to, um, basically you just go on the website and you do the checklist. So you can look at the, review the educational components first if you'd like to. I've had some people that are doing a lot of this stuff already and just go ahead and dive straight into certifying their landscape. But basically all you're doing is just filling out that landscape metric honestly. Um, it is an honor system, but once you turn in the metric, um, you know, if you've, you've got 70 points or more of actions you're doing in your landscape, then you're certified. We'll, we'll email or mail you, depending on your preference, a certificate. And then if you want to purchase a sign, you're welcome to. And that's, that's all there is to it. 
All right. I see Susan says, I haven't looked at the checklist, but I am curious whether you have to pull out non-native and sometimes invasive plants, um, such as ground cover Asiatic jasmine, which I planted years ago in lieu of ivy to hold the soil on a steep slope. So there is a section on invasive species. Um, we don't necessarily talk about non-native, non-invasive species as much as we do invasive species. Um, again, it's just gonna depend on how much else you're doing in your landscape. So say if you're, if you're doing a bang up job with you know, composting and mulching and you do have native plants and you're, you know, there's a number of other checklist items. We do encourage strongly, especially me, because it's one of the areas I work in a lot. If you have, if you have invasive plants, please try to work on getting rid of them. Um, there's, we all have a few non-native things in our landscape, I think, that are special to us for one reason or another, but the more native plants, the better. Did somebody have something to say? Well, if anybody has any other questions, go ahead and let me know. And I'm gonna dive right on in. Try not to go too fast, but wanted a chance to talk to you guys a little bit about pollinators too, because I understand that might be, um, that's one of the things that you're interested in and doing some work on. So this is our Georgia Green Landscape Stewards um, presentation on pollinators. So um, this, this may kind of give you a taste too of what the presentations are like. Let's see. Please name some invasive plants. Oh, Willis, we have a whole presentation on invasive plants on there um, and it is one of my longest presentations. So I would invite you to please watch it. Um, it is available on the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards website, which is uh, at the end of each of these presentations, but I can also put it in the chat box in a minute. I apologize, I'm not working with two screens today like I normally am, so I can't keep things open and switching around as much as usual. But I can, I could spend an hour naming invasive plants. I actually, we just, um, through one of the groups that I work with, we just made invasive species playing cards for coastal Georgia. So each, each uh, card in the deck has a different um, invasive species on the face of it. And it has a picture of it and a short description in the name. And then on the back, it has our Coastal Georgia SISMA logo, which if you're not familiar with SISMAs or Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. Um, all right, Judith, that would be a great question for Melissa actually, because that would be like a presentation in itself. I live in the country and have a lot of land that is former pasture. I would like to create a meadow on part of one of these pastures and need to know how to begin. So I would say the very basics are, you know, clearing out any invasives and planting natives in that area. But Melissa would be a great resource for that. Um, that's a, a very big question and it may even require, you know, a site visit or some more information to to know the best ways to help you with that. But things like um, clearing out invasives, taking a soil test, those things would be um, helpful, but in planting natives there. Um, but uh, Melissa would have some great resources for that and be able to help a little more thoroughly. Um, as far as naming some invasives, just off the top of my head, that may be in your landscape, Nandina, English Ivy, Elephant Ear, Lantana, um, there's no shortage of them, <laughs> um, especially some that are, are popular still in the ornamental trade. But I would really encourage you if you're interested in invasive plants to watch that presentation. All right. So here's our presentation on welcoming pollinators to your landscape. Whoop, not going to change. There we go. So you'll see that um, in every one of our presentations, we also have this brief blurb at the beginning, um, acknowledging our funding source, um, our, our small grant from the Center from Urban Ag Agriculture, and also what our goals are to, um, to guide Georgians in, in creating certified, sustainable Georgia landscapes and protecting our natural resources for future generations. 
So I always like to start by talking about the importance of pollinators. Now I know when I'm talking to a master gardener group, this may be kind of like preaching to the choir. You guys probably know why pollinators are important, but not everybody does. And it always helps to hear good information again. So 80% of our plants rely on animal pollinators for survival. Um, and I do think sometimes we forget that there are more than, than bees and butterflies that pollinate. Um, even though bees are our most efficient pollinators and butterflies are arguably our most beautiful, depending on who you ask. But the annual value of pollination to Georgia is over $360 million a year. So there is an economic aspect as well. Um, that speaks to some people. What speaks to me more is the ecosystem health and the ecosystem services, but everybody has different motivators. Pollinators play a vital role for native wildflowers, trees, and shrubs, as well as a lot of our horticultural crops, things we like to eat, like apples and peaches and blueberries, watermelons, tomatoes. Um, if you like coffee, even though it doesn't grow here, you can think a pollinator for that. If you like tequila and margaritas, you can think a bat for that, because um, it requires a bat pollination. So we have all different types of pollinators, which you may already know. Um, hopefully you participated in the Great Georgia Pollinator Census this year. I know a lot of our groups did. Um, but you know, our, our pollinators are a little broader than we used to think about. So they do include bees, which are our harvest working and most efficient pollinators. But they also include flies and wasps, butterflies, which are people's favorite to watch, I think, moths, beetles, birds. Um, beyond just hummingbirds, but hummingbirds are important, but also things like lizards and frogs and mammals um, that we don't think about quite as often. So today we will focus on our insect pollinators um, for this talk. Um, in the wildlife talk, we do talk more about other, other animals and, and working to invite them or coexist with them in the landscape, both. So with our bees, you know, I think there's more um, love coming to native bees than there used to be and more understanding. Um, but, you know, honeybees are still kind of the poster child of pollination. And though they're great for commercial pollination in agriculture, they're not, um, they're not an important native pollinator. They're not native at all. They're actually from Europe. Um, and though they make some tasty honey and they are good for commercial pollination and as far as management, you know, managing hives and whatnot, um, our, our most important pollinators, especially in the natural landscape, are going to be our native bees. And in North America, we have over 4,000 species of native bees. Um, the interesting thing, too, is that almost all of our native bees, um, with the exception of like our bumblebee, but most of them are solitary nesters. Um, so solitary nesters may usually never or almost never sting unless maybe you catch them in your elbow or something like that. Stinging would only be a last defense because most um, bees and other um, stinging insects that sting do it to protect their nest. So they have to be social nesters usually to um, be much, have much aggression as far as stinging goes. And still it's not aggression, it's defense. Um, but these cute guys on the screen here, you've got the metallic green sweat bee. The metallic bees are my favorite. You can see them in all these amazing and surreal colors that don't even seem like they could be real. Um, greens, but also like teal blues and just all kinds of beautiful colors. We've got the really cool um, leaf cutter bee, which you may have seen signs of in your landscape if you're lucky. And hopefully you don't mind them, them borrowing a little bit and nice, circles from your plants. Um, and then also the longhorn bee is pictured here. We also have a lot of flies that are important pollinators. Um, some of our flies don't look like flies. Sometimes people don't recognize them as flies. Um, we have things like the tachinid fly down here that I think looks like a cartoon. He's so goofy looking, it's very amusing to me. Um, then we have a lot of flies that look like bees or something else, a lot of bee mimics. So we've got the bee fly up there in the left corner. We've got several species of hoverflies that are often confused with bees or yellow jackets. Um, and you can just see there's a large diversity. I mean, this slide only captures a, a handful of them of different fly species. I feel like wasps are the hardest sell for people. Um, 
which is interesting because wasps, a lot of our wasps are solitary nesters. They are not aggressive. Um, and our social nesters, like the paper wasp, as long as you're not near or harassing the hive, or the nest, they're usually not a problem either. Um, you know, they're not, they're not out to get you. <laughs> I really try to encourage people to stop thinking of nature as an enemy. Um, no, no animal, no wild animal, no wild insect has a goal to come attack you or hurt you. Um, that's just not, not what they're interested in. They're interested in, in their own survival. So, um, you know, any, sting or bite from a wild animal or a wild um, insect is, is going to be out of defense, um, not counting something like mosquitoes that don't sting but bite, but that's to complete their life cycle, not defending mosquitoes here. Um, but the wasps, I feel like are a harder sell for people, but we have some really fascinating wasps and a lot of diversity in wasps and a lot of things that, you know, people may not even recognize as wasps or as pollinators. Things like the black digger wasp and the vested wasp, um, the thread-waisted wasp. My favorite is the potter wasp. I'm not sure my husband's quite as much of a fan, you know, like with all the little pots that they build places, he's, he wants to get rid of them, but I love them. I think they're just beautiful. They're so delicate and perfectly done. Um, they're little pot nests that they lay their eggs in. So um, wasp are a good one to have around as well. So Sandra asked, um, do carpenter bees provide pollination? Yes, they do. Um, they are one of our pollinators. Yep. Um, they're, I actually have several pollinator talks and um, I know they're specifically talked about in some of my other talks, but um, carpenter bees are an important pollinator as well. All right, beetles. Beetles are another insect pollinator we don't think about quite as often. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of beetles. I wish actually there were a few more on this slide. Some of them are confused with stink bugs, um, like the two-spine soldier beetle, um, which is a type of stink bug, but is a beneficial predatory insect. Um, so this, this one isn't specifically on beneficials. I am doing a presentation on Friday, if you're interested, of Lunch and Learn on beneficial garden insects. Um, but we've got lots of beetles that do a great job pollinating too, like the tumbling flower beetle and the soldier beetle. Um, things again that we don't always recognize as pollinators. So my, my advice is always how I operate is if I don't know what it is, I assume it's good until I know it's bad <laughs> instead of assuming the opposite. So habitat needs. You know, I think this is something that we often kind of overlook because we know that pollinators need flowers. And I think that's kind of what we focus on, but they need more than that. So just like any animal or any insect or, or any human, um, there's some basic needs. So those include food, water, shelter, and space. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So our first habitat need is food. Um, one of the things, and I think this is starting to become talked about more, but bare soil is really important. And we will talk about bare soil for a food need, a water need, and a habitat need. Um, so having some bare spots in your landscape is really important um, for the food aspect. A lot of insects get mineral salts that they need to survive from that bare soil. They also are going to need for food nectar and pollen, um, preferably year round or as close to it as possible. So, you know, when you're planting those natives, planting things that bloom at different times, um, having a diversity of plants, both in structure and shape, but also in bloom period. Um, so that there's a consistent source of nectar and pollen um, for your pollinators. Insects. So we don't always think about this, but a lot of our um, pollinators need other insects in order to, um, to feed their young, for one thing, or to feed on themselves. So, you know, a lot of our solitary nesting bees and wasps are going to capture other insects and kill them and put them in the nest for the larvae to feed on when they hatch out. Forage for their young. Um, this is a really important one. I'm hoping, uh, the last few groups I mentioned this to, they were already on board, but if you have not read Doug Tallamy's work, I would totally recommend it for any, anyone who's interested in native plants, native ecosystems, or that just wants to continue to live on planet Earth. Um, but one of the things that Doug Tallamy talks about a lot that's really important 
is how important native plants are for raising young. So whether you want songbirds or whether you want pollinators, they're gonna have to have something to raise their young on. And they've often, um, those insects, whether they're the pollinators themselves or whether they're what's eating them, um, those, those insect young have co-evolved over time with the specific plant species that is native. Not a cultivar of a native, not an ornamental, but a non-native ornamental, but they have co-evolved with a specific species that is native to your area. Um, you can see in the upper left there, these are gulf fritillary caterpillars that are on passionflower vine. Um, that is all, that's what they feed on. So if it's not there, they're not gonna be able to complete their life cycle. The same is true, you know, the, the one everybody knows about is monarchs and milkweed, but there are hundreds if not thousands or more cases of this. Um, and the reason why is because plants have defense mechanisms, um, just like our immune system has defense mechanisms. And in order to be able to feed on something, they had to specialize on one type of plant and work to disable that or get past, have a coping mechanism for that defense mechanism, basically. Um, so having those native plants and preferably not the cultivars of them is a really important, important key um, to keeping that food web going, whether it's for pollinators or for wildlife or for both. It's also really important to have diverse sources of forage and nectar. So different shapes, colors, forms, growth habits of plants. Um, this is important too, because if you think about it, so, you know, if you're looking at pollinators, for instance, if you have bees or flies, they have short tongues. So they're going to need flowers that um, are a little more compact, um, you know, more accessible that way, whereas butterflies and moths have a long tongue. So they're going to need things that are tubular in order to feed in them. So having different flower shapes as well and different plant structures is also important. Let's see, it looks like. Mary says, I read something that stuck with me. Nature abhors bare soil. Sometimes that's true. It depends on the landscape, I think. Um, a lot of bare soil will get taken over, but you know, I actually have a huge amount of clients that their constant complaint is that they have a bare spot in their yard. Um, usually here it's because of overwatering, but you know, keeping keeping some, and it doesn't have to be huge areas, but just little spots here and there um, where maybe your turf grass isn't as thick, or you know, in in the forest there'll be some understory where they can access the soil, um, that sort of thing. So our next habitat need is water. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer, but I think we overlook it a lot of times, especially with insects. Um, so this can be things like if you have plants that have cupped leaves, the moisture on those plants can help serve as a habitat or as a water source, a shallow dish. Um, this could be, you know, a thrift store plate that's pretty that you put out and incorporate into the landscape. I've seen people do all kinds of things, um, puddles having an area that you allow there to be puddles, uh, rocks in a bird bath. So if you already have a bird bath for your birds, you could have one little side of it or area of it that you have either one larger rock or several medium or smaller rocks. Basically, they need a way that they can access without drowning. So something like a bird bath is going to be way too deep for your, for your pollinators um, in general, but having a way that they can access that water. Also, if you've got some rocks in your landscape, uh, I like this because it's a really simple, like I don't have to maintain it way to do it. Having um, rocks or flagstones with some crevices or like a pooling area, kind of like you see in this bottom picture, that's helpful. And then again, that bare soil. Um, you can see this butterfly up top that it is, you know, getting its water from bare soil. And I imagine if you've ever hiked in the North Georgia mountains or, um, or even in the Piedmont, near creeks or rivers much, um, you would at some point have seen a group of butterflies that is on bare soil just drinking water. Um, so that's an important source, source of moisture as well, excuse me. And then our, our next habitat need is shelter. I think this is the one that we think about the least a lot of times. Um, you know, we think about the flowers, we may think about the, the water aspect, but insects, um, 
any kind of pollinator as well as our wildlife are gonna need shelter as well. One of my favorite sources for this is log piles. If you have a discrete area, you can do it or you can incorporate it into your landscape. Um, this provides habitat to a number of critters, insects, um, beneficial insects, pollinators, um, decomposers, also things, um, all sorts of things, lizards and, and um, salamanders, um, lots, lots of neat things you can find in your log piles. But log piles not only provide shelter, but also over the winter, they help provide warmth which can be really critical since most of our um, pollinators and insects, or all of them, are cold-blooded. So those, as those logs start to decompose, they actually release heat and provide heat and shelter. Another is rock piles or rock walls with some spaces in them, you know, um, as there kind of naturally is. That's good shelter as well. An easy one is pithy or woody stems. Most of us have some pithy or woody stems in our landscape. The thing is just leaving them, you know, not having to clear out everything that's not um, immaculate and green. Um, if you don't want to leave them as they are, you can always trim them back to about 15 inches tall. Um, but we have a lot, um, as you may know, because bee hotels and bee houses have gotten popular. We have a lot of native bees and other insects that nest in those pithy stems and lay their eggs in them. Um, this is really kind of a better source than the bee hotels and insect hotels. There's some debate over those. I mean, on one hand, it's great to, pr to put out there as habitat if you don't have anything else, um, but you are putting a lot of them in very close proximity to each other. So you may be either A, providing a buffet for predators <laughs> or B, um, having a point where it's easier for them to spread disease amongst each other. So kind of think of it like, you know, Golden Corral in the time of COVID. Just putting it out there. But not to say that they're bad. They're just, if you have a more natural source of habitat, that may be a preferred method. Um, but if not, a bee hotel can still be helpful. So again, that bare soil comes into play. We have a lot of ground nesting um, bees and other pollinators. You can see some, some nests up at the top picture there, um, but having some, some bare accessible soil is really important for that. So another habitat need is structure. So when we're, we're, we're working on our native landscape, we really wanna have vertical vegetation layers. So meaning that everything's not at the same layer, not just ground covers or not just, you know, small herbaceous plants, not just shrubs, but a combination of all those things, trees and shrubs, herbaceous plants, ground covers, because they're each going to offer different habitat and food resources, both to wildlife and to pollinators. Um, if you can have a few areas in your, in your landscape that are a little bit overgrown, that's really helpful. I know it depends on where you live. I know it depends on, you know, for a lot of people, HOA restrictions as well, but just something to keep in mind, it could be a very small area. Um, also, and this is another one that not everyone can do, but depending on where you live and if you're able, um, leaving stumps or snags, snags are dead trees that are still standing or partially standing. With that said, I always give <laughs> the preface with snags, if you can safely leave them. So if you have a snag that's, you know, gonna fall on your house, then maybe not leave it. But you know, if you've got enough space around you that you can safely leave that snag, they are, dead trees are amazing wildlife, pollinator, insect, biodiversity habitat. Um, there are thousands of species that use snags for food and shelter and other resources. Um, but I, I also understand that that's not possible for everybody. So logs or brush piles, they can be very small and very discreet, but that's great um, for structure and habitat as well. And then I'm sure by now everybody has heard that they need to leave the leaves. Um, leaves are really important for life cycles for a number of different pollinators and insects, including your fireflies, which I know most of us in more urban areas don't see a lot of anymore and we probably miss. Um, one, we're not leaving the leaves, and two, we're spraying too many insecticides. Um, those are my theories, at least, but they're pretty well substantiated, I think, based on what we know about fireflies' life habits. 
So um, if you want to see your fireflies, you know, leaving the leaves, if you can't leave them where they fall, if you will rake them, um, not leaf blow them, but gently rake them into maybe um, a border or, you know, a certain area where you can leave them over winter. Um, there are a number of species from salamanders and lizards to um, a number of our pollinators and other insects that need that for um, overwintering or to complete their life cycle for their, their eggs and larvae to develop. Um, another thing is warming areas. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, or our insects are cold-blooded and they need some open flat surfaces to sun in to warm up. So if you've got, you know, just even a, it doesn't have to be a lot, just a couple of stones or flagstones, um, things like that. It, it also could be, you know, if you've got a concrete wall or something of that nature, a rock wall, um, but something where they can, can warm up like you see this butterfly doing. So another habitat need is safety. This comes, in, uh, comes into play, especially with our pollinators and insect populations. So we've learned, um, well, mainly through honeybees, but with bees and other insects too, a lot of times the problem isn't that an insecticide is sprayed on them, it's all of the different types of pesticides that they encounter in the environment are weakening their immune systems. So um, it's kind of these synergies of different things of herbicides and fungicides, things that aren't necessarily targeted towards them but all of that chemical exposure kind of combined weakens their immune system and makes them more susceptible to predators and disease. So if you can in your home landscape, and I strongly believe that in the home landscape, maybe not in the commercial agriculture landscape to produce mass amounts of food for everybody, but in the home landscape, I think it is totally possible to avoid pesticides altogether. Part of it is about changing our expectations in nature. Um, not everyone would agree with me on that. I have some clients that are very gung-ho about pesticides and I still help them to make good decisions and make good recommendations as far as what they need to use and how to use them safely. But if you can avoid pesticides in your landscape, that's gonna be the best thing you can do for your pollinators, for your wildlife, for your beneficial insect populations and for your native plants. Um, if you do apply pesticides, do not apply anything, never apply during bloom, because if you have blooms, you're gonna have um, your pollinators feeding on those things. If you are applying something, choose a spray instead of a dust or a powder. Um, you know, seven is a good example of this. I'm, I'm not a fan of seven because it kills everything, but um, I shouldn't say everything, but a large number of things, um, you can get it as a dust or a spray the spray would be better. The dust or powders um, are often incorporated into pollen stores. So that it gives a higher dose basically um, to, to bees and other insects. If you have to apply um, and you're applying to a lawn, mow before you apply. Um, that way any weed flowers that are out there that are used as bee pasture um, are cut off first so that they'll move on somewhere else before you apply. One of the most important things too is diagnosing the problem um, or the pest accurately before you apply any type of treatment. Um, it makes my skin crawl when I have somebody call and they say, I have this problem. I have tried X, Y, Z, you know, all these different things. Usually they've tried an, an herbicide and a fungicide and all these different things for like an insect problem. I mean, things that wouldn't even have an effect um, or that are totally inappropriate. And usually they're applying them in, in not, the, at not the, the correct rate either. Um, so your local extension office, that is what we're here for. If you have something that you need help with, you're not sure what's going on or what to do about it, don't guess. Um, our, our diagnostic services like that are free unless it has to go to the lab. So, you know, call your local extension office, see if you can get those things diagnosed correctly. Um, what the pest or the problem is, and they can give you the correct recommendation. Also, always follow the label. Um, the label is the law, so if you're applying something, make sure you're doing it as the label says, because any way that is not um, is actually illegal and could be dangerous for you and for the environment. Um, and just because a little is good, more is not better. <laughs> I tell people that all the time. 
If you have to use something, use something that has low toxicity and that's a selective formulation. So um, by selective formulation, I mean using something like, for instance, if it was a caterpillar problem, well, first off, I would encourage you to think about what that caterpillar becomes and whether, you know, the caterpillar is really a problem or not. But also, um, if you did need to apply something for caterpillars, you could use BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It only affects caterpillars instead of using something like, say, seven, which would affect a large spectrum of insects. Using the correct formulation and rates, as I mentioned, also be cautious of drift. People don't think about this a lot, but when you're applying something outside, even if it doesn't feel windy, a lot of times there's drift and it kills things you don't intend. Um, if you do have to spray, spray in the late afternoon or evening when pollinators are less active, that's another thing. But I always encourage people to think about too, um, if you want butterflies, if you want pollinators, then you have to accept some damage to your plants because the reason your plants are there, if you're looking at it from an ecosystem perspective, is to feed those insects. And a landscape that doesn't have any feeding damage is not participating in the ecosystem. It's not supporting the ecosystem or supporting life. So, you know, there's some of these plants in the ornamental trade that you'll see that they're advertised as pest-free or, you know, no insect problems. To me, that's actually a red flag that this plant offers nothing back to the landscape. It offers nothing to the ecosystem and it offers no support. It's basically just there. It might as well be a plastic plant because it's not going to do anything to benefit or act alive basically in the ecosystem. Let's see, we have a few things in the chat. Okay. Where can I find a list of deer resistant native plants? There's extremely large deer population where I live and they decimate pretty much everything I put in my front yard. And so far non-natives like lavender, lantana, et cetera, are the only things that have worked. So we do have, I know there are some lists through extension of deer tolerant natives um, or deer tolerant plants. I don't know if there's one specifically for natives. I would have to look. And that would be a great question for your local extension agent too. Um, Cause they may also know some local resources. Like as far as I know some, some coastal native plant resources that wouldn't apply for you guys up there in, in North Fulton. Um, but Melissa may know some resources that I don't know of that are available in that area. The state botanical garden may have some resources on that too. I will say it's hard with deer because when there's too many deer in an area and they're above carrying capacity, meaning there's more deer than the land can handle, they're gonna be hungry. And even things that are deer resistant, they're still gonna eat if they're hungry enough. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I don't eat spam, but if I was starving to death, I would. You know, it's kind of like that for deer. So even the things they don't prefer, if there's so many deer and there's not enough habitat, which we have some, some areas like that down here as well, um, one of our larger developments, um, higher end developments, they have a lot of deer problems just because it used to be thousands of acres of habitat. They cleared it all to build houses. The deer are still there. They have nowhere to go. They have to eat something. Um, so they're going to eat whatever's there. Um, unfortunately, there's not a, a super easy answer for that. I would encourage you if you're planting non-natives to at least make sure they're things that are not invasive. So Lavender is fine. Lantana, I would get rid of. I know a lot of people love Lantana, but it is invasive and we've seen a lot of problems from it. All right. Do pre-emergence cause problems for pollinators? So potentially, yes. So with pre-emergence, that's an herbicide. Um, it's not gonna directly affect, it's not like an insecticide that will kill them on contact. But as far as those synergies, as far as all those things they're exposed to, they're exposed to pre-emergence the same way they're exposed to post-emergence. So potentially, yes. All right, I think that's it for now. Let's see, I'm doing on time. Ooh, I'm running behind. So I'm sorry, I'm trying not to run behind. Plant selection. So we've already talked about a lot of this. Um, native plants offer the best nutrition to native pollinators. Um, 
there's been a number of studies that have shown this. So the more you have that's native, the better nutrition and resources you're gonna be offering. Aiming for year round bloom, which we already talked about to keep that food source consistent. We don't wanna feed them for a month and then have them all here and have nothing for them to eat. And also putting the right plant in the right place. I think this is a struggle for a lot of people because we want what we want where we want it. And sometimes where we want it isn't the right place for it. So finding things that are suited to your landscape. Um, that have the right drainage requirements, the right sunlight needs, the right soil type. Um, I see this a lot, especially in my county, because we're really kind of strange. We have a lot of marshy areas, but then we have a lot of sandy areas. So, you know, we have things that are na all native to this area, but some that are native to like the beaches and some that are native to the wetlands and they're not gonna interchange well. So, you know, planting the right plant in the right place, having the right habitat needs. I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are this, this presentation, as I said, in the PDF is available on the website. Um, but since I'm running behind, I'm not going to go through them all. But there's um, a number of lists you'll see. These are native perennials for spring bloom. And then we also um, there's more of those. And I would say, you know, checking because um, this is a statewide list so checking to make sure it's appropriate for your area just doing you know a little research on them before you incorporate them if you're not familiar with them but there's also um, three slides of spring bloom and then there's native perennials for summer bloom as well so um, these lists are, are, are available like I said on the website through the pdf um, there's also some more resources. These are a little more coastal focused, but a lot of, a lot of the information on there is also appropriate statewide. Um, UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant has a native plant search engine, which is a really handy tool. We are actually um, starting to partner with um, someone in landscape design at UGA to create a statewide native plant database that's searchable um, to help people find, you know, search for native plants that are appropriate for what they're looking for across the state. But in all honesty, that will take at least a year or two to produce and some student labor. Um, but that is a goal that we have. Um, coastal Wildscapes is a um, focused on the coastal area, but it's about um, native landscaping and native plants um, and supporting local ecosystems. They have a lot of good resources on there. And there's also this great book that um, you can download. This is the PDF that I linked here. It's called Fire Adaptive Landscaping. And again, it does focus more on the coastal area, but it has um, native plant lists for different types. So like it'll have um, moisture tolerant natives list, a salt tolerant natives list, a natives for birds, natives for butterflies, um, drought tolerant natives, that sort of thing. So just a few more resources there. And then you'll notice at the end of each of the presentations in the program, there's also a kind of a review slide that tells you what the, the items are on the certification checklist that came from this presentation. Um, so since we're running behind, I won't go over that. I'll just skip right to questions. You can see right here is our website. We also have a dedicated um, email address, georgiagreen at uga.edu. I always encourage people, if you have questions about the program or the program's resources, please reach out. Um, if you have questions specific to your landscape, please ask your local um, extension agent. They're going to have the best resources and ability to help you. Because um, as much as I'd love to help everybody around the state, and I've gotten a lot of emails like that, um, I actually have a large number of clientele in multiple counties I'm covering right now, but also I don't, I'm not as familiar. I mean, I've lived in Atlanta a number of years, so I'm not unfamiliar, but your local agent's going to know what the recent weather patterns have been, what they've been seeing a lot of, um, what's been bad for them in that part of the state this year. Um, they're just going to have a lot more local knowledge and resources to help you, plus the ability to come out if necessary, so... And with that, I'll take any questions. Let's see. So Susan asked, aren't there some varieties of lantana that are native? I am not aware, I won't say there's not. I'm not aware of any that are native. I am aware of some that are less invasive, um, but they still have potential problems. 
I can look into that, but I, I have not, I don't know of any that are native. So that might warrant some further research. I know that in Florida, which, you know, I'm right on the Florida line, so I get all of Florida's problems. <laughs> um, Lantana is a major issue, as are a lot of things that we're struggling with, like coral ardesia, um, you know, English ivy is a big one. Um, Chinese privet's a big one up y'all's way. For us, it's not as bad down here, but we have pretty much everything else. Are milkweed beetles ever beneficial? I would say yes. I think it's difficult because what we have done is we have taken something that used to grow rampantly and um, wildly and milkweed beetles were a natural predator for it, which it needs, but we have eradicated so much of our milkweed in natural environments um, through development and um, more herbicide spray near agricultural fields that we basically made milkweed into tiny little patches that we've started to try and cultivate ourselves now. Um, so it's just knocked the ecosystem out of balance. I don't think they're inherently a bad thing, but. Do you have any connections with HOAs or landscapers who plant and maintain neighborhoods? That's a great question. So I have a few connections in my county. Our goal um, is that the more people that get interested in the program and in these concepts, and the more education there is, that people can work to get their HOAs on board. Um, there are so many HOAs, that's not something Extension's ever going to be able to coordinate by themselves. Now, we can do education to landscapers and encourage these principles, but what it really is going to take is the people that live in these neighborhoods and work with these HOAs, working with their boards and talking to change the standards, and there being enough people interested in caring to do that. Um, we are planning to present at the Georgia Green Industry Association's um, wintergreen conference in, I think it's January, um, which is basically a landscape, it's, it's a professional organization for landscapers across the state. Um, so we are planning to present on sustainable practices and on this program and trying to encourage more of those. Um, there's a little bit of pushback right now, but I can tell you that those services will do what you want them to do. Um, if there is more interest and outcry from their clientele, um, especially higher end clientele, but all clientele requesting these services, then they'll educate themselves on it and they'll do it. They'll go where the money is. Um, but you know, that's, that's something that, if I say it, it doesn't matter if it comes from me. It matters if it comes from the people paying. All right, let's see. I missed a couple. Okay. My lantana attracts a lot of pollinators, especially butterflies and hummingbirds. So I'm a little hesitant to get rid of the lantana. Is it just because it is invasive or is the plant harmful in other ways as well? So anything that is invasive, I hear that word used inappropriately a lot. Invasive doesn't mean that it's aggressive because native plants can be aggressive or assertive and take over a lot of area. So invasive plants spread to whole new areas um, without you knowing usually. They also displace native species and change the ecosystem. So um, native plants can't be invasive, but um, lantana is, is pretty invasive. I have seen it like planted in a, in a garden, in a home landscape, and then several acres away in the woods having come up and colonized. Um, it's kind of a nasty plant. I know that the pollinators like it and you will find some people in extension who still support it because it attracts pollinators, but it is only a nectar source. It does not provide any other habitat needs. Um, I have a colleague who's a plant biologist with DNR and he says it's like pollinator candy. It doesn't offer any real nutrition. It's just like if you ate lollipops all day long. So, and you know, that may be partly his opinion or his experience, but um, it is definitely invasive and harmful in that it changes the native ecosystem. Um, also the berries and I believe the leaves too are toxic to pets. 
um, and probably children as well. Um, and it, it just spreads rampantly and not always where you, people think of spread is that they can see it, but anything with berries, those berries can be eaten and flown by birds and defecated somewhere else and come up wild and, and take over large swaths of area, so. Jessica, this, this has been a fabulous presentation and we could listen to you talk for probably another hour, but- But I am over time. time. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. And um, I, I would like to you know, encourage folks if they have questions to follow up with you, or as you say, if they're particular for our area, to follow up with Melissa, our agent. And I am, on behalf of everyone, want to thank you so much for such an informative, interesting, delightful presentation. And um, I think I can also say on behalf of everyone that we are going to be so eager to get our, our own gardens and landscapes certified, as well as maybe some of the project gardens that we um, work at. Um, it would just be wonderful to go through your list, get them certified, and of course be the first ones in our area to put up that beautiful Georgia Green Landscape sign. So thank you so much, Jessica. We're, we're so appreciative of the, the wonderful presentation and the time that you spent with us today. Well, thank you.